first of all, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, let's try that again. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, yeah. That, that's how we do it in Simsbury. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out, and Happy New Year to uh, folks who I haven't had a chance to say it to. Very pleased to have you here tonight. Mayor Bronin, Luke Bronin, is here from the city of Hartford to talk about his vision for Hartford and some of the obstacles that he's facing right now. The reason why that matters to us is because our fate is tied to Hartford, just as Hartford's fate is tied to ours. I wanted to uh, recognize some members of uh, local town government that are here today with us. We've got State Representative John Hampton. He's in the back. Thank you, John, for being here. <laughs> Deputy First Selectman Chris Kelly. <laughs> Mike Payne, Selectman. Cheryl Cook, Selectman. And Elaine Lang. We also have from uh, the Board of Finance, Linda Schofield. Uh, there are other members who serve on boards and committees. If you could just raise your hands and be recognized. Raise them high. See, there are more of you here. Raise your hands high. Let us see. Thank you for, for all you do for volunteering for the town. <laughs> what we're going to do is... <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. I love you, too. Um, the way it's going to work is Luke is going to come up and talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in Hartford, some of the issues that are probably going to come up in the legislative session. Then he's happy to take questions from you. I'm, I'm also here to chime in if you need have any questions about Simsbury. So, Luke, welcome. Thank you so much, Lisa. Good evening, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to see such a good crowd here, and I want to thank everybody for coming out on, uh, on such a rainy night. Uh, Happy New Year to you all as well. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much for hosting and for uh, the introduction, and to all of the uh, members of the Board of Selectmen and other local officials, uh, to Representative Hampton, uh, and to everybody who's here. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, as, as Lisa said, I'm going to start out just giving a, a quick overview of some of the things that are going on in Hartford, uh, some of the exciting and good things, as well as some of the challenges. And, uh, and then I'd, I'd love to get uh, as, as quickly as possible after laying, uh, laying out the context and, uh, and giving you some of the, the underlying information, just have a conversation. And I'm happy to go as long as uh, anybody wants to go tonight. Uh, so, uh, you know, I wanted to start by, by asking, yeah. Sure. Yes. Is that good? Can everybody still hear me? Okay. No. We may have, a, we may have to compete before, between the, the television audience and the, uh, the, the in-studio audience. Um, is this all right, right here? Okay. So uh, if, if you can't hear me, just, just you know, do this, and I'll, and I'll uh, try to talk a little louder. Uh, Simsbury and, and Hartford, like Lisa said, are, are so deeply tied together. And you know, I was looking at the, the numbers on paper today, and about 10% of Simsbury's population works in the city of Hartford, which I'm guessing means that about uh, one out of every four families, maybe even more, uh, has a family member who's, who, who's working in the city of Hartford. Uh, but I'm just curious, in this audience, I mean, how, how many here have a family member, either yourself, a family member, or a neighbor nearby who work in the city of Hartford? You know, there are not, not, not too many hands down. Just about every uh, hand goes up. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's an indication of just how tightly we are tied together. Uh, you know, Hartford is the, uh, the economic center, the employment center of the region, has been for a long time. And uh, even on nights like this when the traffic gets bad and the rain is bad, it's not all that far from downtown Hartford to Simsbury. Uh, and as we look at the, the shared future for, for you, your community and ours, I think uh, we have to recognize that they are they're inextricably linked. You know, we look around the country at those places that are growing, those places that are attracting jobs, uh, that are able to, uh, where, where parents and grandparents are able to keep their kids or grandkids uh, in the area, uh, if not in the same town nearby. The places that are seeing that kind of growth and success are, are places that, for the most part, have a strong, vibrant urban center at the center of a region that's able to be that magnet for growth, that's able to retain and attract employers, that's able to be that you know, hub for innovation or entrepreneurship, the place where young people who don't necessarily want to have a car right out of school or maybe not be ready for a house and may not want it at all uh, can settle down, the place where people are trying to uh, start new ideas or new businesses can share those things together. You need that vibrant hub. Uh, and you need a place where companies that have been 
long part of a community, including our big financial services uh, firms, uh, as well as many others that make up so much of the employment base in downtown Hartford, uh, where they can attract talent. Because if you talk to them, and I talk to them often, uh, one of the biggest things they'll tell you is that their number one challenge is recruitment. They lose out to places that are perceived as having a strong and vibrant city center. And so that's one of the reasons why it matters so much, because economic growth uh, requires, in today's America, it requires uh, a strong urban center. You know, uh, the, the Boston Globe did a story a couple of weeks ago about how it was that Massachusetts, which not all that long ago uh, was known as Taxachusetts, had leapfrogged Connecticut in growth. And uh, the answer that they gave was that it, it's all coming from Boston. All of that growth in Massachusetts is coming from the urban center. And we in Connecticut, I think, have, have uh, for a long time fallen behind the eight ball in recognizing the role that, that cities play. So that's, that's one thing. But of course, there are so many other links, you know, the cultural links as well. Now, you guys in Simsbury are home during the summer uh, to the, the summer home of the Hartford Symphony Orchestra. Um, and, you know, I love coming out here and, and going to uh, the Talcott Mountain Festival. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, not possible without the symphony uh, housed uh, at its home, uh, year round home in Hartford. Uh, I know so many of you and many of you personally that, I'm, that, I, that I know uh, are involved in and patronize arts organizations in the city, whether it's the Bushnell or Hartford Stage uh, or Theater Works or the Wadsworth Athenaeum. You know, we've got an, an arts and cultural uh, community, a, a set of arts institutions that cities many times our size would envy. Uh, and that too makes for a strong region. Uh, it's something that we should, that we all share in and should all be proud of. So there are there are fundamental ways in which we're linked together, and there are also ways in which I think we should all be really optimistic about Hartford's potential. You know, if you look at the city right now, uh, there are a number of things happening that are exactly the kind of thing you want to see happen to see an urban revitalization. Uh, next year. UConn is going to open its doors downtown. It's going to bring thousands of students into the heart of the city, along with hundreds of teachers. It's going to physically link Front Street, where you have Infinity Hall and Capitol Grill and the new Bears Barbecue and all of that. going to physically link that up to Main Street area, where you now finally have coffee shops that are open and thriving seven days a week. Uh, and you have you know, little markets that are supporting the residential development, which is the second pillar of, uh, of the uh, momentum in the Hartford area. Uh, urban core. You've got thousands of residential units that have come online that have filled up faster than anybody expected. A year after uh, UConn opens up, you're going to have, for the first time in decades, you're going to have commuter rail uh, connecting us north and south. New Haven, Hartford, Springfield, uh, opening up commuting possibilities that hadn't been there and, and acting as another uh, reason for employers to be interested and attracted to the city. So there are all of these things that, you know, if you look around the country, what, what are the elements of successful revitalization? They're happening. They're in the works. They're not yet bearing fruit, but they're in the works. And that's why, to me, it's so important that we create the space for those things to actually bear fruit. Because we have the possibility of turning the corner. We have the possibility right now of seeing a long-sought revitalization in our capital city that are matter to not just Hartford residents, but to everybody in the, in the region at large. That, with that, take it to the challenges. Because the challenge is huge. And the challenge is, fundamentally, that we've got a fiscal structure that is fundamentally broken. We have uh, a municipal funding system in the state of Connecticut, not just for Hartford, but in the state of Connecticut, that asks communities, including Simsbury, to run their government based on really only one source of local revenue. That's the property tax. And yet in the city of Hartford, you've got a property tax base that's actually smaller than Glastonbury's or Manchester's or West Hartford's. And it's just about the same size as Farmington's. So you've got a city that has real city challenges, including 46% of kids under the age of 18 growing up under the federal poverty line, including the entire region's poverty concentrated in the city and all of the challenges and responsibilities that come with that.
including population and population density, which are significantly different than any surrounding community. You've got all of those things that make Hartford different and make the responsibilities and obligations of government different, but you've got a tax base that's smaller than a suburbs. And that's one of the ways in which it's just fundamentally not built to succeed the way we should all want it to succeed. Now, I will also say that that fundamental structural problem is, uh, is made worse by the fact that there were mistakes over the years. There's no question about it. Uh, and, and I'd be the first to, uh, to shine a light on it. You know, we, uh, as a city, the city uh, borrowed too much over the years. And then what's most frustrating of all to me, uh, in an attempt to buy a little bit more time to push the crisis off, they restructured, refinanced that debt. So now we're walking into just a mountain of debt payments over the next couple of years that uh, our debt payments almost triple in the course of three years. Uh, they also, uh, years ago, not even talking about recent past, but years ago, uh, made contractual commitments, pension commitments, that uh, if anybody understood what our growth rate would be in Hartford and what our tax base would be, no one would have agreed to it at the time. But back in the 90s, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, there were commitments made that are awfully difficult for us to sustain. While all of those things were mistakes of the past, we've got to live with them. They are the burden that we have to carry today. And they really just exacerbate the fundamental problem, which is that you've got a property tax base that's just too small to support a city. Uh, the other thing that the city did over the years, and in some ways this is maybe the thing that I fault uh, some of my predecessors uh, for the most, is that rather than ringing the alarm bell and saying we're headed down a dangerous path, what the city did was raise taxes over and over and over again to the point that the mill rate in Hartford is 74.29. Uh, that's two or three times most surrounding communities. Uh, that makes it awfully difficult to retain businesses, especially small businesses, those businesses that are so important to the health of your main corridors, uh, of your employment base. Uh, it makes it hard even to retain some of your bigger ones, and it makes it virtually impossible to attract new growth, especially when communities around are able to offer some pretty... Uh, nice incentives, and we have seen a lot of Hartford businesses move out to surrounding suburbs because they can cut their tax bill in half by moving in a, a mile or two down the road. So those are some of the, the fundamental uh, challenges. Now, in terms of the scale of the, of the challenge, why is it so big that you know, I've got to come out to, uh, to Simsbury to surrounding towns and talk about these things, and why can't we just manage through this challenge at home without uh, asking to build a broader statewide coalition for change? Uh, the answer is simply, it's just, it's just too big. When I took office last year and we had a chance to really get under the hood and see how big the gap was, uh, we found that we were facing a $48 million deficit in this fiscal year, the one that we're halfway through right now. Uh, that's $48 million just on the city side, not, not counting education, just city side. So it's $48 million deficit on about a $270 million budget. So we're talking, you know, approaching 20%. And if then you think about the fact that a huge part of that $270 million are things that you can't change, your debt service payments, your uh, pension uh, obligations, the fact that you need police and fire, you need DPW, uh, I'm not even saying you need at what levels you need them, but you need them to some extent. That very quickly gets you to halfway through that 270 million in costs that you there's no way you could possibly avoid. So then you're talking about a gap that's between one third to half of the remaining. So we were determined to do everything we could at at home uh, from Hartford City Hall to get our house in order. We cut almost $20 million out of the budget in one year. And that was on top of cuts that had been made on the past. So Hartford City employment is down from about 2,000 employees in uh, the late 1990s to 1,300 employees today. Uh, we are not running fat in, in our departments. We're, we've got a public works department that can barely keep up because they're at their smallest that they've been in many decades. Uh, you've got a police force that's about 100 officers below uh, where an independent study uh, said a year or two ago that they ought to be. Uh, you've got administrative offices that are, uh, that, are, that are struggling just to keep up because they're also so short-staffed. So it's tight, but we knew we had to make those decisions, so we made them. 
We also made some tough cuts. We cut deep into cultural and arts program, which is hard given uh, the city's uh, role and the importance of those things. Uh, we cut deep into things like dial a ride for seniors, senior uh, centers, uh, our library system. Uh, there's really nothing that was unscathed. And after all those deep cuts, we're still not halfway through last year's deficit. So we also built in numbers for uh, am, am, an ambitious goal for uh, our labor savings. And we've gone aggressively after those savings. But we haven't achieved it. We were able to get a significant deal from our firefighters uh, recently. A deal that's going to save the city millions of dollars and make some real long-term structural changes. And we're working with our other unions. But even if we were to get every dollar that we're seeking from our labor unions, it still wouldn't have gotten us through even this year's deficit. And so we, what we had to do was build in drawing down our reserves, drawing them down to zero this year. Uh, that means that even on what we budgeted, we would have been finishing this year with no rainy day fund, no reserves, and facing a massive deficit. Uh, right now, because those labor agreements haven't all been reached and because uh, uh, of some other unforeseen things like uh, a lawsuit from back in 2010 to 2015 that hit the city for $6 million. Uh, there, are, there are additional expenses, which means we're looking at significant deficit in this year. But here's the most important thing. Once we get to the end of this year, we are once again facing a $50 million deficit for next year. That deficit then grows to $70 million the year after that. And it grows to the 90s a couple of years after that. Uh, so we will continue to do everything we can, no matter how painful, no matter how unpopular, no matter how difficult, to get our costs further down. Uh, but there is no way that you can responsibly cut your way out of a gap that big without bleeding a city to death. And there is no way that you can tax your way out of that when you've got a tax rate that already makes the city uncompetitive and is just a road to decline. So that's the fundamental challenge that we've got. And I'm not here to, to ask for, for sympathy so much as I am because I really do believe that we are all tied together and that Simsbury is not going to be strong unless Hartford is strong uh, for all the reasons that I started with, whether it's employment or culture or the ability to attract kids and grandkids back to the area. Uh, as I said in West Hartford a couple weeks ago, you can't be a suburb of nowhere. And... So our collective challenge, I think, is to figure out at the state level how we build a system of municipal funding uh, and, uh, and, and tax distribution that allows a city that is managed responsibly, that's serious about getting its house in order, that's committed to long-term growth and to being the engine of growth for a region that allows that kind of city to succeed. Uh, that's what my mission is, and that's really why I'm here to try to enlist you in that cause in whatever way you're willing to be part of it, even if it's just by talking to friends and neighbors uh, or talking to um, uh, uh, you know, legislators or anybody else uh, to encourage them to see why Hartford matters and why, regardless of how we got here, some of it being mistakes, some of it being the structure that was built a long, long time ago, we've all got an interest in making sure that Hartford can succeed and be strong. Uh, so with that, I already went longer uh, and more detailed than I meant to, uh, and, I, and I hope you don't mind. But with that, why don't I stop there, open it up to questions, uh, and I'd, I'd love to have a conversation, uh, for, like I said, for as long as you want. But thank you very, very much again for coming. And because this is televised, I'm going to hand whoever's asking the question the microphone to, uh, to use while you're asking. Yes. You said that uh, your budget was $270 million for the city. But combined with education, it's like 460 million to 500 million, half a billion, right? And 40% of that is supplied by the state of Connecticut and 10% by the feds, correct? Well, it's fungible. It's totally fungible, though. You know that. Okay, why aren't you reducing the number of people on welfare in Hartford? Fifty years ago, your party started making this state a welfare magnet. And this is what you get later. Crime, people who don't want to go to school, people who want to hang out, make a career of it. And now you come to us. This is your party's doing. You understand that? 
I, I profoundly disagree, but I understand your question. Um, so let me take a couple of pieces of it. First, uh, the money's not fungible. When money comes from the feds or from the state for education, it can only be used for education. Uh, and uh, that's true in Simsbury, just as it is in Hartford. Uh, and and uh, the, the second thing I would say, I would go back to the point that I, uh, that I made a little bit earlier uh, about the level of poverty in the city. And we can disagree about the causes. We can disagree about the responses. But let's just focus on kids for a second. So. Of the kids under the age of 18, 46%, almost one out of every two kids, is growing up under the federal poverty line. Uh, and in many cases, because their parents grew up in the same circumstance, living in poverty, often in a family that didn't have a level of education that they were able to pass down, uh, enormous challenges with educational attainment, with literacy. Uh, these are uh, obstacles that are awfully hard for a young person to overcome. So I would argue that we have an obligation as not just a city and not just a state, but as a nation, uh, not just to continue to do what we're doing to try to educate our young kids, but to do a heck of a lot more. And I think that was reflected in the judge's decision uh, this past year. Uh, you know, one of the things I admire uh, deeply about Simsbury, this is a community that's, that's deeply committed to education. You guys uh, uh, dedicate a significant portion of your budget to education. Um, you know, your mill rate is higher than a lot of communities, and it's because you value education. And, uh, and I admire that. Uh, and I also think that just as a community where the uh, median income here is about $109,000, uh, it's right for that community to focus so much on education. It's also right for us to make sure that kids growing up in a community where the median income is $29,000, uh, make sure the kids growing up there also have a chance. So uh, I think, if anything, we as a state and as a nation ought to be doing more on the education front. Uh, yes, sir. First of all, I wish you the best of luck in your endeavors because you have a tremendous challenge ahead of you. I was fortunate enough to live in three probably enviable cities that would be a model for Hartford. One was outside of Boston, one the city of Charlotte, which is very successful in annexing areas, and also the city of New York. But I must agree a bit with this gentleman here. I think what's happening, it's happening not just in Hartford, but in Connecticut. You've created your own mess. Uh, you've driven people that are earning people out of the city. Hartford has very evidently become a welfare city. And I have seen things in that city that I cannot believe. I've seen cars driving on the street, people dealing drugs right out in the open. Uh, for an hour, ATV vehicles outside a hospital, racing the street, no police for an hour. The city is a city that most people in the surrounding areas do not want to go into. My daughter recently became a nurse in Hartford Hospital, and I'm fearful of her coming home. First week, someone starts rapping on a window on the street. You know, which is coming home at night. So what I'm saying is, I know you have tremendous financial challenges ahead of you, but I think other things not don't come before that, but I think you should take the Giuliani approach. There are so many human factors that have to be done before people really link up to Hartford. You have to get the gangs out of there, the crime. It, it just It's not a city that attracts people. It's for that reason. We would love to go into Hartford and the surrounding areas, but you just can't go in. It's just too dangerous. And I think a lot of money is wasted, and I see the waste. And until that's, that's tackled, until people see this, the populace is, is sick and tired, honestly, of putting money in a black hole and, and just seeing it disappear. Until we see evidence that Hartford's really turning around and you're really doing something significant, I don't think you're going to get much support from the surrounding areas. But I do wish you luck. Thanks for the thanks for the wish of luck. Uh, like, let me let me say a couple of things. Um, you know, I, I think you know again there there is uh, as I said the previous gentleman. There's a lot that I, I disagree with about what you said, but let me say this. Um, I think it's the wrong way to approach it to say until we see evidence that Hartford's turning around, we're not going to help. With all respect, that makes no sense because it's not going to turn around until we change the fundamental dynamic, fundamental dynamic that makes it impossible to turn around. And the fundamental dynamic is fundamentally one of resources. I would disagree with you about the, the issue of waste. Now, I will say we're dealing with legacy costs. That's true. 
there are, there are pension payments that pay, payouts that are as offensive to me and probably more offensive and frustrating to me than, than they are to any of you. There are debt payments that are in, that are frustrating beyond belief when I look at uh, what the city did in years past. That's all true. Uh, but uh, aside from that, there's actually not much waste. And you want to talk about uh, the focus on public safety. That's an area where we are determined uh, to make commitment uh, to strengthen public safety and make investment. But public safety costs money. It costs money to, uh, to attract and to uh, retain police officers. And remember, the job of being a police officer in Hartford is not the same as the job of being a police officer in Simsbury. Uh, you know, when, when you're a police officer in, in Hartford, you look at this past uh, New Year's Eve, and I want to say we just finished, uh, thank God, we finished a year uh, of uh, the lowest uh, number of murders that we've had in a long, long time. I'm not one to, to uh, wave banners about that because that is an ongoing daily struggle to, to combat crime. And I will never declare uh, you know, victory on that until we've had years of nobody getting killed. But police officer in Hartford uh, on New Year's uh, night, uh, foot chase, apprehended a murder suspect on the scene armed with a weapon. You know, that's, that's a serious job. And it's different than uh, that job is in some other communities. Uh, so to, to achieve public safety, you need to have an adequate number of police officers who can get out there, who can deal with the response times, who can respond quickly, not just to the urgent crimes in progress, but to the quality of life crimes, like people riding ATVs. You need to have enough uh, cops that they can be out on the beat and doing the kind of community policing that keeps the community strong. It's hard to do that when you're about 120 officers below where the city was years ago and about 100 below where an independent study says you should be. And yet getting up to that staffing level takes resources and that let me let me let me keep keep going for a second uh, and the same is true in every area, the other area of city life if you want to create a vibrant city you need to be able to make those commitments and those investments in arts and culture uh, that's an important part of the lifeblood of any city that's the center of a region and so for all of the things that we want to I think collectively should aspire to which is to be a region that has a strong and healthy heart a strong and healthy heart that is an employment driver and uh, the home to arts and cultural institutions and experiences that everybody can, do and can enjoy. If we're going to do that collectively, we can't just wait for it to happen and then say we'll get on board. We have to get on board to make it happen. The last thing I would say is, with all respect, I think you're more in a minority than you think you are uh, in how people think of the city. A lot of people uh, come into the city on a very regular basis. I've lived in the city and walked on literally every single street in our city for many, many years. And I've never had an incident. Uh, and I know, I mean, just looking around the room, I know some personally, and I know from being in Hartford, how many people come in, not just from Simsbury, but from Simsbury, Avon, Farmington, Wethersfield, Windsor, South Windsor, Granby, everywhere in the region to enjoy the things that the city has to offer. I was skating on the ice rink, which is the, the free ice rink paid for entirely by private contributions, by the way, not the city. The free ice rink in Bushnell Park uh, this, this past weekend, talking with folks uh, who were skating. Half the crowd was from outside of the city. And let me just flip one other piece because you talk about drugs you talk about uh, people buying drugs according to our police more than half of the people that they either apprehend or encounter buying drugs in the city aren't from Hartford they're from surrounding communities most of the people in our halfway houses aren't from Hartford but they're from surrounding communities most of the people in our homeless shelters aren't originally from Hartford they're from surrounding communities so why are they in Hartford because Hartford's the only place where those things are and so that's if they need shelter, they go to the shelter, and it's in Hartford. Now, that's all the more reason why I think we not only have an interest, but we have an obligation to try to do things a little bit differently. Because what we've done is we've concentrated all of these services that really are regional in nature in one place. And one of the things that I, that I left out talking about, and I can't believe I did because it's one of the most important things when I was starting out uh, in, in the initial remarks, is that more than half the property in the city of Hartford is non-taxable. More than half is tax exempt. And that's because we're home to state government, which has an enormous amount of property in the city. We've got the college, we've got the hospitals, we've got universities, we've got quasi public entities like the MDC or the Regional Trash Authority, what was CRRA that uh, burns the trash for the whole region. Uh, you've got the airport, 
you've got the Greater Hartford Transit District, you've got your shelters, your homeless uh, shelters, your halfway houses, your social service agencies, all of which perform a function for a region as a whole that has largely concentrated not only its poverty but its social service provision in one place. And that presents an enormous obstacle for the city of Hartford that, uh, that makes it even more difficult to deal with those fiscal issues because we're performing a regional service by, holding, by housing, uh, housing all of those things. Yes, sir, all, all the way in the back. I'll repeat the question with the microphone. Thanks for the question. Uh, it, it's a it's an important question. Uh, first of all, I think the most important thing is education and, and the school system. So, you know, one of the areas that we're focused on is uh, improving, uh, in particular, our neighborhood schools. Now, I could, we could spend a whole town hall or five talking about education and talking about education in Hartford. Uh, you know, education in Hartford is not one system. You have your Hartford neighborhood schools. You have your Hartford public school run magnet schools. You have your CREC magnet schools, you have uh, a couple of charters, and you have uh, a couple of independent schools. Uh, so there are many different pieces of the education system in Hartford. You know, the, the core, uh, the, the two main pillars, of course, are Hartford Public uh, Schools and CREC. Uh, the area where we're most intensely focused on are our neighborhood schools. Uh, you know, one of the results of the Chef versus O'Neill lawsuit uh, is that uh, we have concentrated needs in our neighborhood schools, uh, much higher levels of uh, kids with special education needs, um, uh, even higher levels of poverty, mostly concentrated in the neighborhoods that are uh, facing the highest poverty in the city. Uh, so our first focus is on trying to strengthen our neighborhood schools. And that means through commitment to uh, improvement and instructional improvement, it also means paying attention to the things that can really hold a kid back, including exposure to trauma. Uh, and a lot of uh, kids have, have had that exposure to trauma uh, early in life or even continuous exposure to, uh, to trauma. Uh, it's, uh, it's about making sure that we're setting aggressive targets for you know, early learning and third grade uh, reading. It's about going hard after grants that allow us to do uh, early literacy and um, uh, you know, pre-K uh, pre uh, uh, training. It's also, looking beyond that, things like uh, the again, privately funded initiative that we launched this year called the Youth Service Corps, which is meant to give an opportunity for young people ages 16 to 24 who really, they're either disengaged from school or they've aged out of school and they're not working and they haven't had the opportunity to build those work skills to give them the opportunity to work part-time year-round to build that uh, employment experience and resume to help them get on the pathway to a job. Uh, it's also about trying to build connections between our schools and uh, the uh, community colleges that provide some of the workforce development as well as the employers in the area. I, I'm going on and on because there are so many different parts of, uh, of what the city is doing and what the city wants to do but can't yet do to address the, the problem that you talk about. Uh, but I do think that fundamentally the most important part about it is, uh, is strengthening the school system. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the, the right here in the yellow, in the pink sweater. Uh -huh. 
Sure. You know, the, the question is about other cities and, you know, what, what can we learn from other cities that have faced similar challenges? The one thing I'd say, you know, the gentleman over here mentioned that uh, a couple of the other cities that he lived in have annexed property, right? Annexed towns. Obviously, that's not a tool available to the city of Hartford. Uh, but I will say that the absence of that tool, and more importantly, just the geographic size and const uh, uh, constraint of the city, is something that's, that's not all that common. It's not all that common to have your urban core be so narrowly, the, have the borders be so narrowly drawn. Uh, most other cities in the country are much bigger geographically. They have within themselves both the urban core and more middle class or even affluent residential neighborhoods. Uh, they have a broader base that's able to include areas where you, know, you have manufacturing and other land that's available for development. The city of Hartford is 17 square miles. Uh, it is tiny. And so that is one difference from even those cities that you might look to as similar from a, whether it's an economic standpoint or demographic standpoint, uh, you know, it, it, it is distinct in, be, in that it is so small. Uh, the other thing is that if you look at cities that have faced our level of fiscal distress, you don't find many of them that have made it out without significant state help. Uh, you know, even even if you look to uh, nearby, look to a place like Providence or look to a place like uh, like Springfield, which and I wouldn't cite Springfield as the model of you know what we aspire to, but but they have faced some serious fiscal challenges like we have, uh, and it was only with a significant amount of uh, of partnership with the state that they were able to get out of that level of fiscal crisis. Now, if you look at those communities that I don't, I would say are not exactly like ours but that can teach us some lessons. Uh, you know, I think you, look, you can look all over the country. You can look at uh, you know, uh, Pittsburgh. You can look at Charlotte. You can look at uh, uh, Austin, Texas. Um, you can uh, look at um, Providence to some extent now. Uh, and in all of those places, uh, what you find is a, uh, a real commitment to a focused effort on attracting young people, on promoting and supporting, you know, innovation, entrepreneurship, um, public transportation, uh, those things that I cited before are actually things that are in the works in Hartford right now. And that's why I really believe that if we can get this foundation fixed, that we're going to be able to build something strong on top of it. Because those things are in the works and they're already giving signs of success. You know, nobody predicted how many people would want to move into the commercial buildings downtown Hartford that were converted to residential. And yet those things not only leased up quick, but they renewed quick. Uh, and, uh, and so all of those are indications of what's possible here. But we've got to focus on arts, culture, entrepreneurship, public transportation, attracting young people. But all of that starts with having a strong fiscal foundation. So you're out of the news for being in financial crisis. And you're in the news for having a producing theater that's, you know, sending its second play to Broadway, uh, you know, or you're in the news for having a world-class art museum that just had a world-class renovation, you know, or you're in the news for uh, being a place where down at the, in, you know, in the summer, you've got 40,000 people sitting and enjoying three days of, of free jazz in one of the most beautiful parks in the country. Those are the kind of things we want to be able to promote and talk about. And those are things I wish I could talk only about, but we're only going to really be able to promote those things and change that dynamic if we get the foundation fixed. Yes, sir. That's right.
Well, uh, you know what you're what you're advocating is is regionalism, right? What you're what what you're look. Indianapolis is one example. I, I should have given you the microphone, but the question was uh, uh, using Indianapolis as an example of a city that really turned itself around, and one of the main ways it did that was by merging with the county around it. Uh, that's true in Indianapolis. It's also true in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, where Louisville merged with the county around it. It's also true in Jacksonville, Florida, which merged with the county around it. Uh, now, a couple of things. You know, first of all, uh, Hartford County doesn't exist as an administrative body. Right? It's a, it's a line on the map. Uh, but it doesn't really exist in, in any other way. Uh, but the core question, I think, is still just as powerful. Uh, and it goes to the heart of what I've been uh, saying, which is that one of the things that's holding us back is that we haven't recognized how much power there is in acting as a region. If you look at this region, uh, this is a region that the, the Brookings Institution, uh, a couple of months ago, called uh, named with one, just under 20 other metro areas worldwide that they called knowledge capitals because of the concentration of talent and educational attainment uh, and research institutions in that area. That's us. We don't think of ourselves that way, mostly because instead of thinking of ourselves as a region, we think of ourselves as these balkanized little towns. But if we thought of ourselves as a region and acting like a region, there's enormous power in it. There's enormous power in it from a marketing standpoint, and there's enormous power in it from an economic development standpoint. You know, I was talking with, uh, with the mayor of Louisville and, uh, and talking about the changes that happened when they did merge with their county and they began to uh, market themselves that way. Suddenly they were playing in a whole different league. You know, instead of being a smaller and challenged city, uh, they were suddenly one of the top 50 cities in the country. And so when employers were looking at places to locate, they were looking at a different, they were on that list. They were on a different list and they were playing in a different league. Uh, I do think that we have missed something by not having enough cohesiveness as a region to really support each other, market ourselves as a region, and, uh, and get the benefits from that. Now, I don't think that we're going to flip a switch and become a, a county government you know, tomorrow. We, we, we made that decision a long, long time ago in Connecticut. Uh, you know, when we first created a, a state with three and a half, you know, well, then it wasn't three and a half million people, but 169 separate towns. Uh, and then later when we did away with uh, counties altogether, you know, we made that decision and, and we're not going to change that overnight. But we can take steps to act more like a region, promote ourselves more like a region. And I think if we do that, we'll see some of the same successes that places like Indianapolis and Kentucky and many others have. It gets back to having enough critical mass uh, to actually be able to be on the field competing against the players you want to compete against. Yes, sir. It is a great example. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, to, to, if you've been um, following, the press has been been covering that to some extent. That that is one of the things that I'm talking about now. I. I want to separate these two issues because I think it's important to, to separate them to some extent. Uh, the first issue, which I started talking about, is the immediate and urgent fiscal challenges of our capital city. 
Right? That's that's one issue. And regionalism, I don't think, is going to solve that overnight. The efficiencies aren't aren't big enough, uh, and it can't be implemented quickly enough for that to be the solution to Hartford. So I'm not pitching regionalism as the solution for Hartford, but I really do believe that what you describe, shared services, finding efficiencies, uh, doing what most states do, uh, is part of the answer for the state of Connecticut. Not for Hartford, but for the state of Connecticut. You know, we are, we are uh, clearly not growing as fast as many other states. I think that's partly because we don't have strong urban centers to drive that growth. And yet our costs of government rise at least as fast as most other states because we've taken this state of three and a half million people We've divided it into 169 separate towns, and we've duplicated every single service across every one of those towns. You would never build a state like that from scratch. Uh, and so, you know, we do have to uh, have some uh, uncomfortable conversations about how we make this state more efficient in the years ahead. And again, that's, that's bigger than Hartford. That's about making Connecticut competitive as a place to live so that every town doesn't see their mill rate going up. You know, their property taxes going up year after year after year. And I couldn't agree with you more. Your, your example of, the, uh, of the, the emergency services dispatch centers is a perfect example. I think we actually have 109 in the state of Connecticut. Uh, you know, Harris County, Texas, which is about the same size as Connecticut, has one. You know, you said Maryland has three. And don't think these are small expenses. Every town not only employs enough people to be able to answer, you know, the, the 911 calls at peak time, but they also regularly make extremely costly investments in the capital, in the radio systems, in the communication system. That's millions and millions of dollars that we waste throughout this state because we don't do it on a shared basis. And it's just one example. So I, I absolutely think that if we want to get this state to a place where we're not constantly bemoaning our lack of growth and the, and the taxes, we're going to have to do a little bit of things, uh, things a little bit differently. You know, we can't, I don't want to quote the overquoted, you know, in definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. But, but to put it a different way, it makes no sense for us to, as a state to sit around and complain about the fact that we're not growing and complain about the fact that our costs rise too much and not be willing to do the things that other states have done that make them grow faster and make their costs stay in control. So uh, I, I, think, I think it's an extremely important point. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I, I disagree. I think that, first of all, I've been reading the newspapers every day and ask what were the odd goats that have cost you a fortune. Institutionally, you have failures. You're making choices that are totally unbelievable. You cannot sustain the kind of, of, of activity that you're doing. So your budgets are way out of whack because your expenditures are high. You're not looking for any ways to get revenue in. Your inner city should be revitalized in order to bring in money to give people something. If they have something, they can pay something. You have your institutions that at this point, if you've made bad decisions and you've dated over the years and your budgets aren't balancing, that's your problem and you have to fix it. You know, institutions, as you said, we're not paying taxes. Why don't you ask them for money? They can give you money in lieu of taxes as we do to some institutions and it would be fine. They are the ones that are benefiting from the revitalization they are the ones who should be paying, and they can afford to pay. But you have to change your budgeting structurally and budget so that you take care of your finances. You can't go out and have people, uh, find, you can't panhandle to different towns asking for money when you have all these fat cats who are embracing the, the yard goats, knowing that it's totally a, a, a high in the sky, it is totally wrong. People have told you it was wrong. People have told you that the budget would be uh, topsy-turvy. It's your problem, and you went along for the ride. Now you have to fix the problem. So I'm making a strategic error here, which I'm, I've only given the microphone to the people. And all the, all the supportive comments have been in the back. Uh, so I'm going to start giving the microphone to the back. Uh, but it says the man from TV. Uh, uh, the, the, I don't know. I'm, well, let me just let me just address it. Let me just address a couple of things. All right. Let, yeah, so the question. Okay, if that's the question, what are we doing about taking care of our own finances? Um, you know, I answered part of that. First of all, we've made 
deep, dramatic, and I would say uh, uh, cuts that are beyond what what cuts should be made if you want to have a strong, healthy, and vibrant city. That's number one. Number two, uh, you, you talk about the yard goats. So uh, I don't know if you know this, but I was opposed to the yard goats stadium. I I, I, I inherited it. That's true. Um, uh, I, I thought it was a bad idea, and I don't think we ever should have done it. But once you once I got in there, you got to play the cards that you're dealt. And we what the cards that I was dealt is that uh, city had borrowed the money to build it. It had built a half uh, built stadium, and uh, you know. By the time I got in there, uh, it was clear that the project was millions of dollars over budget and, and behind schedule. And so the first thing we did was to try to uh, bring in stakeholders, get the team to put up money, which they had never done on the original deal, uh, get the developer to put up resources, uh, and keep the thing going. Now, when it became clear that this developer was not going to deliver and we lost confidence in them, we didn't hesitate to take action. We took action by firing them, uh, which was a pretty dramatic action. I will say that not. I think there are a lot, a lot of government entities that would take an action like that. But from my perspective, it was our obligation to the taxpayers of Hartford to hold that person accountable, to hold those developers accountable, and say, if you're not delivering and we've lost confidence in your ability to do it without coming back to us to write more checks, you're gone. And we got their insurance company to step up and take responsibility, to come to the table, to oversee construction and completion, and to fund construction and completion. And to me, what I hope that uh, signals, as frustrating as the baseball uh, 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 stadium you know, has been for me, uh, what I hope that demonstrates is a different level of accountability and a different level of respect for taxpayer dollars. Because I think what would happen in a lot of communities, and probably why this developer thought you could get away with it, is that people would be afraid of taking the risk of throwing the guy off the job, so you just keep writing checks and doing more change orders that cost more money. That's not the road we took, and it's not the road we're going to take, because we, we treat taxpayer dollars as if they're things that matter. Uh, all I can do is make the best decisions I can make to play the hands that, that we've been dealt. Now, uh, uh, beyond that, I would say, you know, you, you talked about getting uh, nonprofits to, to pay. Uh, first of all, don't think I haven't asked. But, uh, but second of all, uh, I can't compel it. State law uh, makes those institutions tax exempt. And that's a state policy decision to promote institutions like hospitals, which, by the way, serve every community in the Hartford region, not just Hartford. Uh, and it's a policy to support state government, which serves every community in the state of Connecticut, not just Hartford. Uh, you know, again, if you go back to all those tax-exempt institutions, those aren't institutions that we chose to place there. Those aren't institutions that we made a policy decision as a city that say, we want to be the hub for nonprofits. Uh, but take the South Meadows, which is a thousand acres of, I think, some of the most strategically located land in New England. You've got about 700 acres uh, at the intersection of 91 and 84 on the riverfront, not disconnected from the riverfront like the rest of the city. Uh, and what do we have there? We have a trash burning power plant that burns the entire region's trash, about 70 towns trash, by the way, polluting and making the air quality in Hartford less good, where the asthma rates are higher. Uh, you've got an airport that does not do a whole heck of a lot for the city of Hartford, because there aren't a lot of folks in Hartford who own airplanes. Uh, you've got a, an MDC sewage treatment plant, which takes up an enormous amount of space and uh, emits noxious fumes sometimes that you can smell. Those are the three biggest landholders on this strategic prime area of land, and not one of them pays taxes to the city of Hartford. They do pay small amounts of payments in lieu of tax. For all of those together, we get less than $2 million. Uh, but it's minuscule compared to the potential that that area represents. And yet, Hartford is home to those things which serve the entire region or the entire state. So I, I wish it was as easy as going to you know, the hospitals, universities, and say, we need you to shell out money, but they have obligations to their mission, to their boards, to their institutions, and uh, you know, and and uh, we have no ability to require them. The question up here just now was, how about the insurance companies? Well, insurance companies actually pay a lot in taxes because the property taxes are very high. So the insurance companies, uh, in many cases, uh, are paying far more than they would pay in other communities, and have done that because of their commitment to the community of Hartford, which I am very grateful for. So. Uh, Yes, ma'am, in the green sweater.
We'll see what happens. I'm mean, you the microphone, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> well, let me start off by saying something nice then, <laughs> which is I think you are um, articulate and uh, obviously a strong leader, and you're what Hartford needs. And I'm, I'm proud to say my family supported you, and I'm glad that we did because I think you're doing the right things going around and trying to make it better. Um, and you do have a very, very uh, tough set of cards that were dealt to you. Um, that said, you know, there are, I think, big issues in expecting other towns to, and I'm not quite sure what you expect, so maybe you can come back at the end of my long monologue um, and tell us what you're looking for specifically in terms of our financial participation. Um, but I think that there's, you know, some hurdles to get over before people in communities like ours are going to feel comfortable anteing up more. And I want to be very specific in using that word more because I don't want you to have the impression that we're not anteing up now. We pay a lot of state taxes and get back very little in return compared to what Hartford gets out of state funding. Um, so we do subsidize Hartford already. And in terms of the arts, um, I think if you were to look at who donates money to the arts in Hartford, they're sitting in this room. So. We do a lot for Hartford already, and I'm glad that we do. We should, because we are tied to your fate. Um, but I don't want to feel like it's expected that we have to do more without considering a few uh, other things on our side of a um, ledger. First off, you talk about pilot and you know the 50% plus part of the town of Hartford that's not taxable. Over 30% of our town is open space. And in addition, we have a bunch of private schools and town government land. So I would submit that we're almost uh, at half as well of a non-taxable -tax land. So you know, it's, it's not a totally different situation than what you have. Um, I want to uh, associate myself with the comments that uh, were made behind me about you know, looking for us to ante up. We may be willing to do that, but not without, you know, we don't want taxation without representation, or we might have to have a, you know, throwing tea into the bay or something over that. Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, folks want to have a say in how their money is used. And so I think as you're looking towards where to go in the long run, um, this gentleman in the front talked about wanting to see a turnaround, and I, I, I think maybe what he's what I, what I would say is we're not expecting a turnaround before we ante up, but we want to see um, uh, some increase in our trust level of how the decisions are going to be made. And and you're saying you've made a bunch of cuts already, but you know in in Simsbury and I'm sure in many other of the suburban towns, we've made a number of the hard decisions that we want to see made in Hartford before we feel comfortable anteing up more. Um, and without going into a lot of detail, our town employees don't enjoy some of the benefits that your city employees do enjoy. And so for us to pay more in taxes um, to support uh, pension spiking, and I know you don't like those things either, but some of those kinds of things that um, your city employees get, when we don't give that to our own employees is unfair to our employees. Our employees in this town ante up a really significant chunk of their paycheck towards their own pensions. Um, new employees aren't getting uh, defined benefit pensions. The ones who are on DB benefits are paying 10, 12% towards that. I mean, I, I think if we saw you making those same kinds of decisions in Hartford, you'd get a lot more sympathy in the, in the suburban communities. So, hope that helps. Thanks. So I, I guess I would say, first of all, those are exactly the changes that we're making. So if you look at uh, the Hartford uh, fire contract that was just ratified by the Hartford Fire Department, um, they, uh, it was, it was dr dramatic changes. Uh, it, were, it was uh, changes to health care, fundamental structural changes to plan design and health care. Uh, it was um, a dramatic increase in uh, pension contributions. Uh, it was a... Uh, a uh, for active employees, not just new employees, changing the terms of their defined benefit to push out the number of years that they had to serve to get there. Uh, it was dramatic changes for new employment employees, including eliminating the uh, the costs for the city of uh, retiree health care, you know, so that we get those long-term costs under control so that this isn't just about 
saving some money now, but shoulder, but but shifting the burden onto the next generation. Instead, of making sure that 20 years down the road, people can look back and say, "Hey, that was a contract that that uh, you know was forward looking." So those are exactly the things, and I could go on and on about the the changes that were made there. And that's the the model that I that I'm going to continue to strive to get with all of our uh, unions. Uh, the other thing that I would say is that uh, you know it's it's not just cuts. You know, I, we have made some very deep cuts and. Uh, and they are cuts to things that matter in people's lives. Uh, but it's not just cuts. It's also just the attention to rigor and accountability and seriousness in budgeting. And I guess what I can say is there's nothing I can do about what came before. Uh, the best that I can do is try to do it differently and try to bring that level of management and uh, and accountability and determination to treat taxpayer dollars responsibly that every city should have. And I am determined to do that. And everything I do every single day is about that. Uh, but the thing I would say is we don't have time to wait five years and see how it turns out because the crisis is right now. And nobody's raised it yet. But let's talk about what the alternatives are. Um, if we're not able to make those fundamental changes in the revenue structure to the city of Hartford, uh, we will not, like I said, we will not be able to tax our way out of this challenge. We will not be able to cut our way out of the challenge. It's a recipe for killing a city if you do those things. And so a lot of people have asked about bankruptcy. Here's my, my answer to that. Uh, first of all, municipal bankruptcy is not like corporate bankruptcy or personal bankruptcy. You don't just get to walk away from your obligations. Uh, you have those ob fundamental obligations as a government that you have to continue to deliver. You can't stop delivering public safety. You can't stop having a police department or a fire department or a uh, department of public works or a school system or any of those things. You can't. Uh, and you have to have a, if you want to have sensible budgeting, you have to have a finance team that's capable. You have to have a budgeting team and a tax collection department that's capable. Uh, you can have very small ones, as we do now, but you've got to have them. So you can't get out of lines of business. You're in those lines of business to stay. And you can't walk away from your debts either. What happens in, corporate, in, in, in uh, municipal bankruptcy is there are really three possibilities of what things, things that can happen. Number one, the court can... Uh, oversee negotiations that lead to changes in pension benefits for retirees. Number two, uh, court can oversee negotiations that potentially result in lower debt payments, cutting some of your debt away. And number three, it can open up contracts. You still have to collectively bargain those contracts. They don't just impose the terms of those contracts. You still got to go through the normal process. Those are the three things that bankruptcy does. But it would be a mistake to think that bankruptcy is the way of just shedding those burdens for a whole bunch of reasons. Number one, even if we as a city had not a single dollar of debt next year, we would still have a deficit. If we had not a single dollar of pension obligations next year, we would still have a deficit. That's how big those, those holes are. It's inconceivable in a bankruptcy that you're going to do more than just take the top off of some of those obligations. You're not going to go, you don't go, you know, s cut your obligations by 75%. It just, that's, that's not what happens in municipal bankruptcies. So you would go through that whole process and you would still be fundamentally unsound because you've got a structure that doesn't work because you've got a property tax system with a city that doesn't have enough property to tax. So that's number one. It just doesn't, it's not going to get you there. Number two, it's highly uncertain. There have only been a few bankruptcies in the entire country, and the outcomes vary hugely bankruptcy by bankruptcy. So you can't say, we know what's going to happen at the end of that process. You go in and you roll the dice, and you don't know what judge you get, and you don't know how the hedge funds that might have bought up your debt are going to act, and you don't know th that at the end of two or three years of vicious and costly litigation that you're any better off than you were before. Maybe you are, but maybe you're not. In the meantime, here's what we do know. The entire state of Connecticut, not just Hartford, would be on the news on every channel and every newspaper in the country as the first state in the country with a capital city that went bankrupt. And if we think that General Electric moving to Boston made it hard to attract business growth in the state of Connecticut, 
let our capital city go bankrupt. That would be a reputational stain that this state would take years to get over. And it would stop in its tracks our efforts to try to change that climate, change that perception, and get this state growing again. So because of frustration about some decisions made in the past, if we cut our nose off to spite our face by embracing the path of bankruptcy and going through all of that cost and uncertainty, not knowing where we get to, and in the meantime do huge damage to the reputation of this state, I think we'd be nuts. So what I'm proposing is that we as a state, let's take the pilot formula. You could get almost all the way through the challenges that we're facing if the, the payment in lieu of pilot means payment in lieu of taxes. It's, it's a system that was set up in the state years ago where the state was supposed to reimburse communities for the non-taxable property that they've got. Uh, and there was a formula set up. The state hasn't fully funded that formula for years. Now the formula is, in my mind, not a great formula because it actually treats state property much worse than other non-taxable property. So for Hartford, where we've got all the state property, uh, it's not a great formula. But if all you did was fully fund the existing formula, that would be an additional $50 million a year to the city of Hartford. If you changed the formula and treated state property the same way that colleges and hospitals and others are supposed to be treated in that formula, it would produce another $70 million to the city of Hartford. Uh, that would get us most of the way to being able to deal with these challenges while still making cuts. Most of the way to be able to deal with these challenges in a way that could give us long-term predictability, tell our employers and our, uh, and our big companies that they can count on a stable, predictable uh, Hartford for years to come so that we can begin the process of really rebuilding and marketing. So uh, that's one answer. Uh, now, obviously, the question is, where's that come from? Right? Uh, and not just where does it come from in general, but where does it come from at a time when the state of Connecticut is facing one and a half billion dollar challenge. Uh, and I don't mean to be flip or dismissive about this, but the first answer from my perspective is, it doesn't really matter to me where it comes from, but I don't think we should think of this, uh, this legislative session as a success unless we've made progress in dealing with these fundamental issues that make the city of Hartford fight with one eye on time behind its back. Uh, there are a couple of ways you could do it. You know, I'm sure that there are going to be more cuts up at the state level this year. There's no question about it. Uh, as those cuts are being made, if I had to guess, there's going to be cuts to municipal aid. We saw the first round a couple of days ago when in mid-year the state cut $50 million out of uh, state funding. I expect we're going to see more of that. I'd be surprised if we don't see more of that. Uh, so in that context, at a time when not just the city of Hartford is struggling, but towns are being cut, I think it's time to have a conversation about how we stop being the state that's most dependent on property taxes. Let's start looking at ways to diversify revenue for municipalities. So maybe that means an increase in the sales tax that goes all to local government. Uh, and it can go to local government in some cases with strings attached, uh, in other cases not. You know, For some towns, getting tax revenue diverted back to the town would allow you to keep your mill rate down or even lower it, giving some tax relief on the property tax side. Other places like Hartford, we wouldn't have the luxury of actually getting relief. We'd only have the luxury of survival. Uh, but that's one thing that I think we ought to be considering because we are too dependent at the local level on that one source of revenue, the property tax. Uh, now, you, you asked another, I know I'm going on for a while here, but you, you asked another question about um, how do we know that the money is going to be spent wisely. Uh, that should be part of the conversation up at the state capitol too. You know. Nobody's expecting, I'm not expecting, uh, an enormous change in the revenue system, and the revenue structure, without also some controls that help ensure that money isn't wasted. Uh, I have no problem with that because I'm determined not to waste money. So that should be part of the conversation too. But the bottom line is if we don't change the current system, the only alternatives are alternatives that are bad for the entire state, and I think profoundly bad for the entire state. Yes, sir. Well, I mean, yeah, because you're on the, the public access TV, so.
Yeah, thanks, Mark. All right, first, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, I think it's uh, great, and I, I do think you're doing an excellent job uh, in Hartford. Uh, it's kind of ironic that you're standing uh, right in front of the picture there on the wall of the, uh, of the state capitol, uh, and uh, maybe you'll be there someday, and I, and I, I think you will be. Um, <laughs> first, let me preface my remarks by saying that I've worked in Hartford for 32 years. Uh, I work for a company that uh, was founded in 1866. It's called the Hartford Steam Boiler Inspection and Insurance Company. It's still there. Uh, and it's also Hartford's uh, fifth largest taxpayer. So somebody mentioned the insurance companies, and, and we're right there. Uh, the, the task that you have before you is not an easy one. Um, you know, the, the problems that are facing Hartford, you articulated very well. They've built up over a number of years. And a lot of the speakers have touched on those, and I'm not going to do that. Um, in preparation for having the opportunity to speak to you this evening, I actually read through your 2017 budget, uh, all 351 pages. I must say I, I, I didn't memorize every line, but uh, I, I do have a pretty good handle on it. And I do want to compliment you on the five principles, and many of you in the audience may not know this, but the five principles the mayor used to formulate that budget are to keep the mill rate the same, make realistic projections, find substantial savings, don't or limit selling city assets, and continue to deliver essential services. And I think those are really uh, things that, uh, quite frankly, that the mayors uh, before uh, Mayor Bronin uh, and the council should have done over the years, particularly when the financial crisis hit in 2008, 2009. Uh, so you face some, some really some major challenges here that uh, many towns and cities uh, do as well, including fluctuating state aid, um, non-taxable properties, we heard about that, Linda mentioned uh, that, rising uh, pension uh, benefits, uh, healthcare benefits, that, that all have to be done. And I think you're taking a lot of the good steps. Uh, I'll also say that, you know, I was chairman of the Board of Finance here in Simsbury for many years, so I sympathize with a lot of the challenges that you have. And, and how you have to, to deal with those and balance the needs of your citizens, your taxpayers, uh, and all of the constituencies that are uh, with it along with your citizens. Uh, with respect to reorganization though, or regionalization I should say, uh, I would argue in many cases that it already exists. Um, Simsbury, like many suburban towns, pays a state income tax. Uh, we pay sales tax. The income tax, goes over to, to the capital, and then it comes back to the, to the cities in the way of transfers. Uh, now, if I read your, uh, your budget correctly, um, you had in your budget, you had an educational expenditure of $283 million, uh, receiving $266.7 million of intergovernment revenues. Now, that's mostly state aid and, and federal. Um, and that's on an overall Hartford budget of about $544 million. I think that was the, the correct number. So in a way, the cities or, or the towns are already paying for many of the, uh, of the uh, burden that the, the towns or the cities have. Um, another example uh, would be here in Simsbury. Where were the founding members, uh, founding communities of open choice? Uh, Simsbury currently has 144 students in pre-K through grade 12. Um, and we're, we're happy to do that. Um, unfortunately, one of the issues is the money does not follow the student. So we get somewhere between three and $4,000 per student, but Hartford is able to keep the rest, which is not just Hartford, it's, it's everybody. I mean, you have to, that's, that's state mandate uh, as to how that formula is. So. My point there is really just that many aspects of regionalization already exist. Um, uh, I, I'm gonna keep my remarks short though because there's a lot of people here who wanna talk. Um, and those of my colleagues know that I could go on for, for quite a long time and I'm not gonna do that, okay? But I, I do think you're doing a great job keeping uh, expenses under control or trying to get them under control. 
think you need to continue to do that. You will uh, find it a struggle, I'm sure, to get additional state aid uh, in the coming budget year. Uh, I don't think the idea of a regionalization that would encompass a lot of the things that you want to do uh, are going to happen in the next couple of years. The economics, uh, the, the physical strain, fiscal strain of the state of Connecticut is probably not going to allow for that. However, I think if you do continue on the path that you're on, you will get the house in order. There's going to be pain there along the way, but what's going to happen then is you are going to make Hartford an attractive place for businesses to come in. And that's what you need. You get the businesses to come in, they'll generate the revenue, uh, and then Hartford will be on the right track for, I think, what you want to accomplish. I just hope that you're, you're able to be there for those number of years and haven't moved on and somebody else comes in and doesn't have the same vision that you do. So congratulations on, on your election, but and keep it up. So there was a, there was a lot there. Um, but let me let me touch on a couple of pieces. You know, you, you you said that in some ways we have regionalism already because uh, tax revenue is distributed from the state back to uh, c communities like Hartford. Uh, I would just distinguish that's I wouldn't call that regionalism. That that is redistribution. You know, and and I think it's appropriate. You know, given given the fact that you've got such a concentration uh, of poverty in one place, uh, the income and the property simply isn't there to generate the revenue in your capital city. So if you're going to provide public safety and all those other essential services, the revenue's got to come from somewhere. Uh, but I would distinguish that from regionalism. And I think it's really important because, like I said earlier, I'm not talking about regionalism as the solution to Hartford's problems. I am talking about it as something that would help us as a state keep the costs of government as a whole in every one of our communities down. And and so I would agree, there was one point that I would very much disagree with is that we can't do that right now because of the state's fiscal challenges. I would say we have to do it right now precisely because of the state's fiscal challenges. At a time when the state's gonna be cutting back on municipal aid, what better time to figure out how we can deliver municipal services more efficiently and share some things better. So that's, that's one thing uh, I would say. The second thing is I, I genuinely appreciate your, uh, your, your Kind words and your and your confidence, um, you know, in uh, in in my administration. The one thing I would say, which I, I similar to what I said earlier, uh, if we had time to de develop that, you know, four year track record or eight year track record, and say, see, look, we've we've changed uh, the way everything's done. We've built this track record. Now let's all get together and really invest and take it another level. I would do that. I would love nothing more than to do that. But we've got a cliff. And the cliff is six months away. And I don't think it's anyone's interest for us to fall over that cliff. So we're going to keep doing everything that we can to get our own house in order. And you, I, I appreciate you reading those five principles. Those are the, the, to me, those are the sound principles, of the five basic sound principles of budgeting. And they're going to remain the principles that we budget by. Uh, but, uh, but we don't have time to just... Uh, go year after year after year to do things a little bit differently each year. We have to make some fundamental changes. And I expect that those changes come with accountability. I expect and want to be held accountable for sound management and responsible government. I want that. But if we don't change the revenue structure, we've got a cliff that's about six months away. Uh, yes, sir, the black jacket. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you're a brave man to be coming here. I think one of the biggest problems that all municipalities have to deal with, and it is not just Hartford, it is also Simsbury, is that a staggering amount of our budgets are related to our employees. Whether it is with the school budget, when you have the necessary expenditures for teachers, for support staff, et cetera, you have the pensions. Likewise, on the other side, the municipal side, you almost 80% of budgets tend to be going towards either dealing with salaries or dealing with the contractual obligations. How would you be able to present to a municipality like Simsbury, who has its own contractual obligations, 
and how would you be dealing with Hartford's own contractual obligations in the relatively short time frame that you're talking about that would make something like regionalism a reality where because what is what i've been hearing is a wonderful thing let me let me preface by saying regionalism is a good idea when i was in college i rowed in a boat if you don't row together you're not going very far and you will really suffer if you don't get other towns like us in agreement, regionalism isn't going to work. And if the biggest bugaboo is the contractual obligations that each town, all 169 of us have, is these massive amounts of our budgets being paid through a legal obligation, how do we address that in order to make the regionalism a reality? Thanks. So uh, I, I think there were sort of two, I, I don't know if I remember, but I think there are kind of two distinct questions there. There's, there's one, uh, and maybe I'm just hearing them, but uh, distinct questions. But uh, one is, you know, how does a city like Hartford demonstrate that we're making uh, the changes and getting our, our own uh, contractual obligations uh, in line so that uh, others are comp you know, uh, comfortable that we've done what we can to restructure government? And I, that comes back to the answer before. We're, we're doing it. Uh, we're doing it the hard way, which is contract by contract, an aggressive negotiation, and looking for the long term. And you know, we we just I would challenge you to find a a contract uh, that did quite as much in quite as short a time as the contract that we just agreed to with the fire department, uh, with our firefighters association in Hartford. Um, so that's that's one way. Uh, but another, the other part of the question is, uh, how do you work together when you we each have our own separate contracts, and uh, this is something that that I've been talking about with a, a number of uh, my colleagues, mayors, and, and others. Uh, I actually think we ought to take a look at uh, our state laws and see whether there's a way to build a uh, a process by which communities could share functions and the the unions would bargain jointly. So if you know Simsbury and Avon wanted to join two of their departments that were represented by separate unions, there would still be collective bargaining. But it would be done jointly. It would be done in a unified process uh, so that uh, at the end of the day, instead of having two different contracts that don't really fit together, you could have one contract that's coherent, that works for both sides, and that both communities agree to. So I think there are some uh, changes like that that would require state uh, law changes that, that are worth exploring. Uh, yes, sir, in a blue striped shirt. Thanks. Uh, in preparation for tonight's meeting, I also looked at the uh, the budget you had out there. I think it was actually 357 pages. I didn't read them all either, but uh, I did glance through them today. Uh, one of the things that uh, stuck out when I was reviewing the numbers was about the fire department. You mentioned a couple times tonight that there's been some uh, favorable negotiations there. But one of the things that stuck out to me was that it was roughly $36 million is what goes to the fire department in Hartford out of your $550 million or whatever. So it's about 6.5%. So I went to see how that compared to Simsbury's budget. And I think Simsbury should have known this as far as a zero, because it's all volunteers. So one of the things I was then researching is, well, I Googled, could a large city have a volunteer fire department? Or is that like against some law I'm not aware of or whatever? I found a very interesting article that was on the Washington Post about a year ago, but it's still relevant. And one of the things that it talked about is how one of the big problems a lot of large cities have when they have these budget crises is um, the, the, the fire departments and how they're not volunteers, and they could be. It gave an example of, uh, it was Pasadena, Texas, is a town of 150,000 residents, which is bigger than Hartford. They have 250 volunteer firemen, compared to the 320, I think it is, that Hartford needs. And they managed to get it done somehow, and they've been doing it since the 1930s. So it is possible. Um, I would never suggest, you know, cutting out the paid salaries of the firemen now, but this would be a long-term solution, not short-term. But is it possible through attrition as paid firemen retire, replace them with volunteers. Because then over time, you'd reduce that salary, you wouldn't have the benefits, the, the pension, all that. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not familiar with Pasadena, Texas, but I'm familiar with Texas. Uh, my wife's from Texas. Uh, and what you don't find in Texas, usually, 
is uh, highly dense urban centers uh, with uh, uh, multi-story buildings uh, and with extremely old housing stock. For the most part, you find spread out, low-scale uh, buildings with a real lack of population density uh, and relatively newer structures. So I, I, w I actually would say I, I do not think you could responsibly uh, address a city like Hartford's public safety needs with a volunteer fire department. Uh, you know, I, I, there are a lot of volunteer fire departments that uh, that struggle with response times. You know, that's I, I have an enormous amount of respect for volunteer firefighters; they do a great job, but uh, they don't always, in the middle of the night, get there as quickly as your paid firefighters. And I will tell you, one of the things that stunned me most: uh, pe people say, well, "What surprised you about becoming mayor?" One of the things that stunned me most that I had no appreciation for the number of active fires that occur in the city of Hartford. And it's for a whole bunch of reasons. I mean, some of it's the, the aging building stock. Uh, some of it uh, is um, uh, the, uh, you know, in some cases, just not just the aging stock, but bad wiring or other things that, that happen. In some cases, it's uh, a, a lack of awareness or education that we're trying to combat. But there are an enormous number of active fires on a regular basis. Uh, and I think if you were to try to address that with the volunteer fire department, you would actually be putting uh, a great number of lives at risk. Yes, ma'am. Um, I like to oversimplify things once in a while. And it sounds to me like uh, you're really talking about two kinds of problems with solutions that are different. Um, you have a short-term problem, which is falling off a cliff which is very serious, which is going to happen very soon. Uh, you have a long-term solution in regionalism, which is going to be extremely difficult, very time-consuming, very political, and so forth. Now, so let's concentrate on that short-term one. Even though you came out here to talk about regionalism, let's not for a minute. <laughs> How are we going to solve the six-month cliff? You must have something uh, fairly substantially written on paper because we're going to have a legislative session that starts in a month. Uh, Governor Malloy was your former boss. You must be pretty close with the office. Uh, is there something sort of concrete that you're looking at? So I think your your division of those things is basically right. We have the short term, but I would rephrase it in one, differently in one way. Uh, Hartford has this near-term crisis, although I believe it's not just Hartford's crisis, but it's the, the region's crisis and, and the state's crisis. And uh, the state has this long-term, uh, more uh, longer-term, I wouldn't say long-term, longer-term um, imperative, I think, to do things differently so that we bring down the cost of municipal governments and, and, uh, and deliver our services more efficiently. Uh, I mentioned earlier that you could, you could solve most of Hartford's urgent problems through the full funding of the pilot formula. Uh, and so the short answer to that is, is to, to make the case that if the state is facing a $1.4 billion deficit, it should really think of it like a $1.5 billion deficit. And I don't yet know how our legislators are going to uh, approach that. They're working on that now, and they're going to be working for the next six months to deal with that. And I suspect it's going to be a combination of cuts, uh, of negotiations, uh, and maybe of revenue. And if it's of revenue, Coming back to what I said before, if it's a re uh, increases in revenue, my hope is that we use this as an opportunity to help communities across the state of Connecticut, not just Hartford, by reducing reliance on the property tax. In other words, our sales tax is still pretty competitive. If you look regionally, nationally, our sales tax is, is, is pretty competitive. If you uh, raise the sales tax, Don't have to, we don't have to pick a number. I mean, if you raise the sales tax uh, half a point, it would generate about five, uh, about $350 million. Uh, that would be enough to fully fund pilot, not just for the city of Hartford, but around the entire state. And there are communities all across the state that are dealing with the challenge of non-taxable property. Not to the same level that we are, but many of them are dealing with that challenge. So you could address a statewide problem uh, by reducing the reliance on property taxes and providing some relief to those communities that have a disproportionately high amount of non-taxable property. That's, that's one of the ways you could do it. But, but again, I don't mean to be dismissive or, or, or flip about saying I don't, I don't care how it comes. What I mean to emphasize is that we don't yet know how the state's going to deal with the $1.4 billion problem that it has or $1.5 billion problem. We don't even know how big the problem is yet. Uh, but it's clearly big. 
it's clearly going to take a combination of things. And my pitch, my, my answer to your question, what is it that I think we all should be advocating for, is that wrapped in with that response to the state's fiscal crisis is a response to our capital city's fiscal crisis. Because ultimately, the only way we're going to get out of this cycle of fiscal crisis at the state level, what you know, the budget director at the state level called the permanent fiscal crisis, the only way we're going to get out of that is through growth. That's the difference between us and the states that are beating us right now. It's growth. And the only way we're going to grow is if we put our cities in a position to be the engines of growth like they are in all those other states that are beating us right now in the competition. Oh, sorry. I'm a teacher, so I've seen, and I've taught in Hartford, and I've taught in, I've done long-term subbing here in Simsbury, and I've taught in Avon. So I've seen the differences in the schools. Um, and I can speak to the fact that in Hartford, they're getting by with no, next to nothing in the schools. So just, just putting that out there. But that's not my question. That's just a statement. My question is this. When my kids are faced with a huge project, or a huge challenge like this, one of the things that I often say to them is, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer is, one spoonful at a time. You have a lot of people here with a spoon. What can we do to help you in your work as individuals? Thank you. Thank you uh, for the question. You know, I. It, I don't know if it's a satisfying answer, but it's a simple answer, which is just uh, if, if, if you share the belief that we all are tied together and that you can't, you can't be a suburb of nowhere and you certainly can't be a thriving suburb of a failing city, uh, then spread the word everywhere you can. I mean, spread it to your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, um, because I think there are a lot of misperceptions out there. There are a lot of misperceptions about uh, efficiency or inefficiency in Hartford government. And I would say, I understand why the misperceptions are there, because Hartford hasn't always been that efficient. But we are truly making the difficult changes, the decisions that are needed to get the house in order. Uh, number two, to spread the word that it actually matters, that you're not going to be able to contain the fallout of Hartford's failure when we have such a tightly knit region. And number three, to spread the word that we actually could change this. We can actually change it overnight if we developed a state budget that adequately reimbursed our capital city for all of that non-taxable property that it hosts that serves the entire region. If you spread the word about those things, uh, again, with, with friends, with neighbors, with legislators, uh, that's all that I can ask. Uh, that's the biggest thing that I would ask. Beyond that, I would say come in and you know, enjoy Hartford and uh, go to, the, go to the, uh, the theaters and go to the, mu uh, the, the movies and go to the, uh, you know, the museums. Uh, and, uh, and go to our beautiful parks and, uh, you know, go to our festivals. You know, come and enjoy what is a, uh, a regional resource uh, in the city. Thank you. This gentleman back in the back. Oh, sorry, he, he's had his hand. Sorry. Thank you, Mayor. I, I just think you're doing a wonderful job, and I'm supportive. Thank you, Mayor. You've... I think you're doing a wonderful job, and I'm supportive of you personally. Um, but I have some comments to make. One of them is that I think you're a little bit blithe about your, and I don't know, I, I can't contradict you. Uh, dollars to donuts, your medical health care uh, insurance policies for your fire firemen, which you just spoke to, I'm sure they're more lucrative than, than those offered by, we'll say, Aetna, which is a very large health insurer, to its own um, employees. So I really think that you're being blithe about also the, the possible benefits. If, you see, if we see a cliff such as it is um, in six months' time, that's insurmountable. And then you see the edge of a, of a apocalypse coming, Armageddon, in subsequent years, and I, this is an anathema, an anathema to me, I used to work in Hartford as a bond underwriter, surety bond underwriter, and bankruptcy is just, I, I just have terrible thoughts about it. 
but why you would not be better, Hartford, and possibly the region, would not be better off with bankruptcy, because it's only fair that I'll tell you that I'm the guy who wrote the letter that was the first letter in today's paper. And it is a craw in my saddle, sir, that some guy who's a, a cop, works hard, takes risk every day, but he retires at less than the age of 50 with a, with a, a pension of $129,000 plus benefits. The only, that's just, that, that my money is going, you being used, my tax money is, is being used to subsidize that, just bothers the heck out of me. So that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Uh, it bothers the heck out of me too, um, as a property taxpayer in Hartford. Um, so I'll say a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, I'm not being, I'm not certainly not being blithe about it. I hope, I hope that, I, I don't know, um, it's the last thing I am. I mean, I, there's nothing I take more seriously than trying to uh, tackle head on what I think is a, a regional and statewide crisis that um, has the potential to set us back as a state if we deal with it the wrong way and has the potential to put us on the path to uh, catching up if we deal with it the right way. Um, and I guess I would come back to a couple of things. Number one, uh, I understand your frustration, but I do think that uh, pushing our, our capital city towards bankruptcy or thinking that that's the desirable outcome just in order to show Sean, teach Sean Spell a lesson, the cop that you're referring to, is cutting off your nose to spite your face. You could save a little bit. You could say, hi, we got you. You're not walking home with your $129,000 pension. But in the meantime, the rest of the country is going to be looking at Connecticut as a place that can't get its act together. The rest of the country is going to be seeing a place that for the first state in the country has its capital city go bankrupt. I don't think that's the way for us to, to grow. I don't think that's the way for us to turn around the perception. But the other piece is this. Uh, for all the Sean Spells that are out there, and there are not that many of them, there are also a lot of people who are retiring after uh, making what many of our DPW employees make, which uh, in many cases uh, is in the 30,000s. And they're retiring on a uh, pretty modest pension after long years of actually pretty grueling physical work. And you go into bankruptcy, it's not Sean Spell just that gets hit. You don't know who gets hit. Probably everybody, including those folks who, after long years of service, not making all that much money, uh, counted on this as a retirement to, put them, to feed themselves and their family. So you can't target it in that way. It's not a precision. Bankruptcy is not a you know, precision-guided munition. Uh, so... Uh, it's a, it is a really blunt, really big tool, uh, a lot of collateral damage. Uh, yes, sir, standing up in the back. Thank you for coming tonight. Appreciate uh, you, you coming out to Sims Ray. You and I share something similar. We're both elected officials, and to that end, we're accountable to these folks and your folks back in Hartford. And you sound honest. You sound like you're doing a good job. I think you are doing a good job. I also read your budget. I think it was 368 pages. But, uh, um, and I commend you for the cuts and the changes you made because I think you are going in the right direction. But the problem is, is your government needs to outlast you. And when you're gone or you don't get elected or you move on, you, know, you and I can share the same fate. You don't have the checks and balances in Hartford to be responsible. Your, your last 50 years of history has shown us that. You don't have a strong board of finance like we do that says no and hold you accountable. I mean, I'll loan you Linda Schofield. She can come out and, uh, and we can get Nick Mason out of retirement and some other folks and, and help you make those hard decisions. So are you looking at structural changes to your government so that when we write you a check or somebody writes you a check, it's sustainable and it, and it lasts beyond you? Thanks. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you know, but this last, last spring, uh, I did what, you know, most mayors would probably think of as uh, uh, unthinkable, which is I went to the state and I asked for a sustainability board that was going to look over our shoulder, uh, that was um, you know going to take the place of arbitration panels and arbitration, that was going to um, uh, be that body that held us accountable. Uh, I have no, I, I am, I believe that we've got a team that is committed to accountability, and so long as I'm there, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that that's true. Um, I say a couple of things. Number one. You know, the state of Connecticut budgets year to year, or every two years, rather. Budgets every two years. Um, amendments, uh, adjustments year to year. So uh, 
if all of a sudden the city of Hartford looks like it's not being responsible again, it's possible to change policies at the state level. Right? That's one answer. The other answer is, uh, as I said before, let's have that discussion about what measures of accountability are necessary to make sure that we don't just, uh, that the city of Hartford doesn't fall back to irresponsible ways. Let's have that conversation. The third thing I would say is, even if we get what I'm proposing, which is you know the equivalent of full funding of our pilot formula, that barely keeps us afloat delivering essential services. We're not all of a sudden looking at a windfall for the capital city that it's going to allow it to go back to awarding you know unsustainable pensions and you know spending lavish amounts of money on uh, on on uh, on stadiums. It won't allow us to do that. It'll allow us to get by this get by by the skin of our teeth. It won't even allow us that that much. Probably wouldn't even allow us uh, to lower our mill rate from 74, which, frankly, I think we should all want Hartford to do if we want Hartford to be able to grow. So, that's those are the three answers I would give. I've shown by the record that I'm willing to embrace accountability, uh, perfectly open to a conversation about what that looks like going forward, and most importantly, there's not a lot of extra cash that's going to be sloshing around. That money's just going to keep things keep the lights on. Yes, sir, all the way in the back. I mean, we went through this back in the early 80s uh, with this guy named Weicker, who's basically said, we've got one revenue stream with the sales tax, implemented income tax. Now the sales tax, I think, is the fourth largest revenue stream in the state's bankrupt. And you're on a ship that's sinking, and you hope to be the gem that shines through. Uh, and I don't, I don't know that's going to happen. Until the state gets its fiscal responsibility in order, I have a hard time seeing that Hartford will be able to uh, succeed in what your efforts are. Thanks. So, um, you know, I, I guess I, my answer to that would be the same one as uh, as before, which is. The answer to Connecticut's fiscal challenges is is in growth. You know, it, our our growth is flatlining compared to states, including uh, other states in our region. And if you look and if you look at those places uh, that are growing better, and you look at where that growth is coming from, it is coming entirely from urban centers. Massachusetts growth is entirely from Boston. New York's growth is entirely from its cities. The same is true if you look state by state. That's where growth is being driven now. So if you want to go back to Weicker as the, you know, it's looking at the, the beginning of the ills, I would, I, I would say it a little bit differently. I'm going to go back to that. I, I mentioned that uh, Boston Globe article that talked about Taxachusetts and, and how it changed and why it's no longer Taxachusetts because it's grown its way out of it. And in diagnosing Connecticut's problem, what it says is that Connecticut is in a suburban economy in an urban age. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. We, we didn't concentrate our economic development efforts in hubs the way most places in the country did. And we're paying for it now because it's harder to attract talent, it's harder to retain talent, it's therefore harder to attract and retain businesses, and it's harder to get that growth that we want to see. And when you get into that spiral, it's a very hard thing to get out of. But the only way we're going to change that is by creating those places that people and businesses want to be. There's no other answer to that. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't things that have to be done at the same time. And I would say that actually the state, for the first time in a long time now, um, is actually making some, some significant changes. I mean, last year's budget was the first budget in a long, long time where there were pretty dramatic cuts to state government. Uh, and I think in this year, when they're facing a billion and a half dollar deficit, I think you're likely to see uh, a, a lot more. And I think uh, for all that we... Uh, for all those who say, you know, we're spending too much at the state level, I think you may also be concerned at the type of cuts that come this year when the state starts to scale back, especially if those cuts fall on municipalities, which is why uh, I think we all ought to be open to looking at other sources of revenue that are going to help offset those cuts to municipalities like sales tax, unless you want to see your property taxes go through the roof. I think that 
everybody wants to see us cut our way to growth. And you've made this point over and over again, that growth is what fixes the problems. California, not so many years ago, was hopelessly in debt. All the budgets were hopeless. Responsible cuts were made, big cuts were made, like you're trying to do in Hartford. But it was the growth of the economy that made that brought California back and made it all disappear. We should, you're going to get your money, and you're going to get it from the state, which means it's going to come from us somehow. It's going to, it's going to, I could just give you some now because it's going to come from me somewhat. But, but what we should be talking about is how do we do this regional thing? Because you're right, like Louisville, if we were more than just downtown Hartford, if we were this region, we would be awesome. We would be terrific. But how do we do that? We've all saw, we've all seen the horrible government in Hartford. So we are not willing to let that happen again. So how do we do that and have control over that? And the other thing is, we take a lot of pride in being Simsbury people here. How do we maintain control to be able to keep the quality of life that we've put a lot of time and energy and money? Most of the people in this room volunteer on committees around this town and do things around the town. How do, somehow that vision of how regionalization happens, because it has to happen. We will never see the leap that Louisville saw unless we do this. We will never, we will continue to drain slowly, painfully, until this region is, is, is nothing, unless we do this, unless we go to this regional model. How do we do that, have a voice in Hartford, and still have a voice in the town that we live in? The one thing I'm sure of is that there's no one answer to that question. I mean, that's that's a let's let's have that conversation as a region. You know, let's 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 figure that out. Let's negotiate that. Let's let's start with those things that don't that aren't essential to the identity of the town. You know, let's go back to the example of the of the dispatch centers. You know, could you still be Simsbury with your uh, you know your your passion, your love for this community, and your commitment to the community and independent identity if you shared a 911 center with a few towns? I think you probably could. Uh, and I think it's probably not the only example of that. And then when you start talking about other functions where uh, you know they may be more uh, more core to the identity, then those are the discussions that have to happen. Those are negotiations that have to happen. But until we start with recognizing that we can't keep doing things differently from any every other state, and then bemoaning the fact that we're different from every other state. Uh, so I, I don't have the answer for you. All I know is that we've got to accelerate that conversation. And what's not enough is to do what we've done for the last 20 years, which is talk about regionalism, talk about regionalism, but not get any farther than sharing the dog catcher. So it's uh, it's just about 8 o'clock. Um, I, I said I would stay, and I really am happy to stay. But I want to, why don't we uh, why don't we take a couple, couple more, and I'm happy to stick around for a little bit uh, after that. Um, yes, sir. Would you speak to um, your conversations or the other mayors of large communities, of large cities in Connecticut, with the state legislature? Because much of what you've talked about, and I know that's longer term, is requires changes in state law and requires a change in state and attitudes and actions by our state legislature. And so we're sitting here talking about, yes, we have to figure out what we do, but the state legislature has a huge role in what we're talking about. That, that's absolutely right. And I, you know, there was a joke yesterday that I'll be up at the Capitol. I mean, just earlier that I'll be up at the Capitol tomorrow. The opening day of session at the legislature is tomorrow, and uh, I suspect that we spend a lot of time up there this uh, this session. And I think uh, mayors from around the state probably will be too, uh, because while Hartford is uh, facing the most urgent distress, there are others that on this, that are on a similar road. And it's in many cases for the same reason, which is uh, the fact that we are so fragmented and the fact that you have a concentration of non-taxable properties. Uh, so I think there are, there's going to be a lot of discussion up there and a lot of mayors up there lobbying. Now, I get the other pieces, it gets back to my answer to the to uh, the question about what folks can do to help. You know, I'm, I am going to be having those conversations. Mem uh, other mayors are going to be pushing those. But uh, but ultimately, that's got to also come from, from communities, from communities all across the state. And... Uh, and I know this isn't the direct answer to your question. It touches a little bit on the previous comment, but um, we do need an attitude change in this state. You know, we, we can't keep just complaining. If things aren't working, we've got to do some things to fix them. 
and we know some things that aren't working, and it's pretty obvious. So uh, I think that we need to make sure that folks hear that at every level, from mayors, from boards of selectmen or, or city councils, and from constituents. And, and getting back to the other point, as part of that attitude change, let's not accept that Connecticut has to be a place of frustration and stagnance. This is a great state. I mean, this is a state where within, you know, 30 miles of the capital city, uh, you know, or 40 miles of the capital city, you can be, you know, in the mountains or you can be by the, by the, uh, by the sound. You know, you can be uh, in world-class art museums in New Haven, uh, New Britain, or in Hartford. Uh, you can be seeing incredible arts and music. You can have beautiful landscape. You can live in a community like this and work in the city. I mean, it's an incredible quality of life, and it could be even better if it's growing again. So let's, let's decide that we want to be ambitious as a state again. And then once we decide we're going to be ambitious, let's remember that you can't achieve anything if you're ambitious, if you're not willing to take some risks. And uh, if we get at least that far, then I have a lot of confidence that we'll be able to figure out the answers to the kind of structural questions about how do we you know, maintain those things that we hold dear while also recapturing uh, you know, those things that we've lost. So why don't we, it is 8 o'clock on the dot, why don't we uh, stop there? Um, I'm happy to stick around, uh, like I said, and just talk on the side. But I really want to say thank you again to everybody for coming out tonight. I appreciate it. And, um, and I hope to see you in Hartford. And Lisa, thank you again. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.